I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present today. This is a, an unusual talk and I'm excited to give it and really look forward to the discussion. The title is Challenges and Opportunities in HIV-Related Implementation Research for Marginalized Populations. And I will note the word research is missing, but I've already uploaded these slides and it would be difficult to change. So, so the goal is really to talk uh, about doing research where the investigator has very limited agency, which is a place where I find myself often. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about a process that we undertook some years ago to think about how to create guidelines to do better engagement uh, and the reasons for doing that. And so I'll first talk about the, the sort of context for that, which is really the existing ethical principles and guidance documents that exist in the context of the implementation of research talk then about uh, the respect, protect, fulfill guidelines in terms of standards of care, engagement, and specific activities. And then I'll move on to really talking about some of the thoughts that we've had about HIV-related implementation research for key populations specifically in terms of designing for individuals and really integrating context, which is so often relevant in, the, in this research, and then some thoughts on moving forward. I don't have a lot of time today to talk, but I'll just say that there are some existing guidelines around engagement in research. So UNAIDS and AVAC have a document called Good Participatory Practice, Guidelines for Biomedical HIV Prevention Trials. UNAIDS and WHO have a document around ethical considerations in biomedical HIV prevention trials, and there really are many others. The challenge that we found was that the existing ethical guideline documents have given limited consideration to specific communities that were affected by structural stigmas like criminalization. And so we really wanted guidelines that focus on ensuring that marginalized and key populations are not excluded from research, but really that research and communities were made, of both their right, uh, made aware of both their rights and responsibilities. So the aims of this work are really consistent with, I think, the work that we try to do, which is really well-designed and really meaningful research uh, done with co marginalized uh, communities and really challenging social, political, and human rights contexts. Uh, and that is particularly relevant for implementation research because these are real world programs. Uh, we wanted to provide a checklist for research and community organizations supporting these communities to consider in the design, conduct, and implementation of these research studies. And we wanted to offer lessons learned through a series of case studies. I won't be talking about those today, but obviously those are available in the links uh, included in the bottom of the slide to read more about where the challenges were, where the opportunities of really meaningful community partnerships were. I am not going to spend a lot of time talking today about autonomy, beneficence, non-malevolence, and justice. All of you should have completed uh, your human subjects research documents uh, and really should understand these elements well. But just to say that you know we hold these as fundamental throughout any of the elements that we would do. And it was really more around implementation of these rather than redefining uh, well understood and well accepted ethical principles. So respect, protect and fulfill is a commonly used framework within human rights. And it really speaks to the increasing amounts of active work that is required to ensure people's human rights. And so first, the least that you need to do is respect the human rights of people which means refraining from interfering with the enjoyment of their rights. The next level up is really protecting rights and so creating mechanisms to prevent violation of human rights and social harms by others, and really taking the action needed to ensure that neither state authorities, including governments or non-state actors, violate the rights of participants uh, or staff in your research studies. And finally, the highest bar is really fulfillment, which is working towards putting in place policies, procedures, and resources to enable people to exercise their human rights and it really represents, again, this most active of components. I'll also note that there is the minimum standard of healthcare that should be offered in the context of research. And so fulfilling the rights of all participants means ensuring an adequate standard of healthcare relevant to your research study, which again, for implementation research is normally, but not always related to the delivery of service. And so, you know, that means the rights to privacy, autonomy, confidentiality, dignity in, in those services, and really to non-judgmental humane treatment interactions with all staff, which may sound easy, but really requires a lot because we're not just talking about the clinicians, we're really talking about the security guards and the drivers and everybody 
to ensure that all folks that arrive on that site are treated appropriately. I'll just say that, especially when you are working with communities where you have limited agency, and probably even for where you are working with communities where you do have some agency, engagement is just the most important thing that you can do. And really meaningfully engaging with communities is going to improve the quality of the science and also its uptake and implementation. And I think especially the more repressive the environment, the more critical the role of community engagement uh, is. Now, traditionally engagement happens when you are funded and you have a finished protocol and then you're just like setting up a cab, um, you know, and I will note again that in the more repressive environments and places where you have limited agency, it really should start a lot sooner than that. So engagement should start sooner and, you know, really try to do it in the context of grant development, which may mean for NIH, like helping people with biosketches, engaging in research, explaining to them and, and integrating their perspectives into the work into the study design um, in, in, and ensuring that their thoughts are well reflected there. And then absolutely in the context of analysis interpretation, because it really is gonna support that validation and dissemination of the work, which again, for implementation research is just fundamentally important. So what does that practically mean? Well, there are some engagement rules that you may wanna consider, complete a situational assessment, work with the local community to understand the interest in the work that you think is important and they, their assessment about the safety to do that. Work with governments, you're almost going to have to do this. Ethical review boards are often housed within governments. Coalitions need to be built uh, between community and government to ensure that this work is safe because if you don't do that, you might do the work and then really put everybody at risk after you finish doing the work. Um, and you likely don't live in that setting, or you may not live in that setting, and, and, and you may not share that risk, um, although local community members will. Uh, and so really having clear risk mitigation plans in place, and so having really detailed plans um, and actively practicing uh, responses to things like raids, or if bad media stories run, or if there are attacks on participants, or if there's been an inadvertent disclosure, or other potentially uh, ad, uh, significant adverse events. Well, the formatting of this slide is suboptimal, but I'll just say uh, there is a lot of value of engagement in terms of really engaging folks early. And I just want to try to highlight that. And you can read some of the examples in, in our guidelines document, but really supporting that engagement early is going to strengthen the quality of your work. It is more work up front, but the dividends are significant. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the process, um, but it is in that guidelines document uh, in terms of some of the elements, again, from the perspective of respecting people's rights, actively working to protect people's rights, and then again, this highest level of really fulfilling people's human rights. Here is uh, an example of uh, a tool that we developed uh, for people doing work with LGBT communities or here specifically gay men in, in bright uh, constrained environments. Um, and those tools are included in there. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it today. And while this is really focused on gay men living with HIV or at risk for HIV in any specific setting, um, you know, it, the elements of it may apply to communities that are historically marginalized in, domestically in, in the United States that uh, face racism and uh, uh, other stigmas uh, in, their, uh, in their home and in their communities or to other communities internationally uh, that are also affected by other legal frameworks or suboptimal individual healthcare related or structural stigmas. One interesting thing that emerged here was really that it's not just a passive process on, uh, from the perspective of the community, but there are active elements that the community may want to take on. And we provided some examples here, again, also from the perspective of respect, protect, and fulfill, just so that they also can have a guide in terms of some of their rights and their responsibilities uh, for consideration.
The next thing to really consider is how to design interventions for historically marginalized communities. And here I've included some implementation determinants frameworks, and I'll just note the ones that we end up using often. Um, and so, you know, the promoting action on research, implementation, and health research, which has elements around evidence, context, and facilitation. And then, of course, CIFR, which has uh, different domains, including intervention, outer setting, inner setting, individual characteristics, and process. Um, I tend to use CIFR more. The reality is you can use any framework. It's just that you need to give special thought to some of the elements that may affect historically marginalized communities that may not affect other uh, groups that you may be looking to do research to support. So this is an example where we use CIFR uh, to guide implementation for key populations. And we kind of gave thought to the different subdomains within uh, each uh, primary domain. So for example, in outer setting, you know, there might be elements about thinking about what was the program funding coming from, uh, because there could be, you know, elements sensitive to priority changes, policies and laws, obviously, criminalization, treatment guidelines for key populations specifically, elements around violence, stigma, discrimination, within inner setting to give thought to structural characteristics and network and communications, because these are really relevant. Folks are highly networked, both in terms of social and sexual networks. What is the implementation climate, the receptivity of the work? Characteristics of the individual. People will have different levels of self-efficacy. People may be, find themselves in different places within the stages of change because it's really uh, sensitive to external stressors, levels of knowledge uh, within the community and beliefs and, uh, that, that folks have, again, based on their external context. Um, and, you know, each uh, sub-construct really affects the intervention par participation and retention. And then, of course, the focus on uh, intervention characteristics. And so what is the source of the intervention, the strength of the interventions, the relative advantage, the adaptability, the complexity, the cost. All of these things are going to be specific to key populations and really deserve uh, for folks to really give the thought needed and, and so again, we published this paper as a guide, but you could use any framework, any approach, the key being that you are spending the time needed to think about how each of these elements are specific to key populations and planning accordingly. It's also critical to give thought to population level characteristics. Key populations are as diverse as any other population. And so, you know, giving thought to which key population and which setting. And so here is an approach where we've given thought to, you know, what is the target? And so embedding research within existing KP programs may allow for some uh, meaningful population inference, but there may not be the level of data collection that you might do in a peer research study. You know, what is the source in terms of defining the person, place, and time of the key populations to be represented? The sampling methods um, being used in the actual study. So is it facility? Are you doing this in the community? Again, it's going to affect representation. And then of course your sample. And there are going to be people who choose to participate within implementation research that, that engage may be more prone to compliance and programs and thus are not represented. So it's just important to think about this. So as an example, um, you know, our, the broader target is all female sex workers at risk for HIV in a different, in a specific country. The source might be female sex workers uh, within three urban centers of country X in, in year uh, Y. Um, you know, the broader uh, sampling methods might be non-pregnant female sex workers at risk for HIV infection, recruited from hotspots in multiple urban centers in that country. And then finally, um, you know, thoughts around your sample are non-pregnant female sex workers at risk for HIV infection, recruited from known hotspots who enrolled in a prep study in three urban centers of country X in year. So again, it's just important to think about, you have your sample, but what is the context of that sample? Because at each level, there are going to be decisions that you make that will affect your inferences and will affect your work. And that's not a bad thing. It's just important to be very, um, you know, kind of uh, thoughtful and uh, about those decisions that you are making. So in the context of a short talk, um, I don't have the time that I would like to go through all of this, but here's an example of our CIFR constructs uh, that for a nurse-led uh, study for cisgender female sex workers in South Africa, here we've included some elements around the intervention for the provision of second line treatment specific to sex workers in terms of the evidence strength and quality, the relative advantage, adaptability, complexity, cost, 
you develop these together with community leaders, uh, program leaders, and obviously our research questions in terms of what we know to be important. Here we've gone through the same setting in terms of outer setting, in terms of patient needs and resources, external policies and incentives. We've done the same process for the characteristics of the individuals, which uh, here uh, are related to sex workers as the program benefactors, but also the providers and ministry officials. What are their knowledge and beliefs about the intervention? What is the self-efficacy of delivery, other personal attributes? And then also giving thought to process and, and what is the process by which we are engaging folks uh, in this work, again, to really better define our implementation strategies uh, and land also on things like our study design. And finally, for inner setting, uh, we included assessments of the implementation climate, the tension for change, compatibility, the relative priority, the readiness for implementation, and the available resources. Again, it's not that the specific information is, is maybe relevant, but it's just the fact that uh, this is the process that we use in order to really prioritize our strategies that we thought were going to be responsive to what uh, our implementation diagnosis had been in terms of the challenges in delivery of treatment to historically marginalized communities in South Africa. So that was an incredibly short talk, or at least it feels that way. I'm sure I'm, I'm over. Um, but it's just to say that, you know, when you are working with communities where you have limited agency, which is often the norm in the context of HIV related work, it is not universally the norm and we're hoping this changes more, but it is, remains often the norm. And I think, you know, we, we appreciate the value of research that it can be effective in increasing the quantity and quality of, of HIV prevention, treatment, uh, services for historically marginalized communities. But really, it, that is the sort of limit there in terms of, of these, this research achieving its potential is based on effective engagement that can really support the maximization of the benefits and, by the way, minimizing harms of this research. And, you know, I gave you an example where we used CIFR, but you can use any planning determines framework, but it's important to do that work a priority, to give thought to how to, to do that and so that you can give, you know, that you can really plan strategies uh, that are responsive to gaps and, and diagnoses, but really makes sense for the context uh, and the communities that you aim to serve. Thanks.